Well, it's that time of day. It's seven o'clock. I put my phone on silent. I'm about to fall asleep, but we've got an hour of questions. Already had some in from you. Thank you so much. It's been busy. It's always busy at Wildlife Aid this time of year. Um, and I think this week we're going to, or this month, we're going to focus on rescues. So Laurie's brought a whole load of kit in uh, from the rescue car. I have no idea what it is. I've never used it. But um, we'll see what we can do with that later on. So we'll fire off a few questions first. If any more come in, please ask Laurie or Abby. They are sitting here next to me. Um, Abby's combed my hair. She's made sure my shirt's in the right place. And she's mm -hmm. got a hair off the side of my jumper. So I've got my own personal dresser now. Sorry, Adam, no offence at all on that one. Um, so somebody kick off with the first question. Let's see where we go. All right, so the first question we've got rescue-wise is what do you use to climb trees and do you need any sort of special authorizations to do so? Yeah, well, to climb trees is very special equipment. It's called lorry braley. Um, we point it towards the tree. We put in the Duracell batteries. Uh, we click the on button and off he goes. Um, there's quite a specialist kit to climb trees and obviously if it's a dangerous tree climb, we have two climbers, we don't just have one. Um, we have a chap called Tim or Richard or one of the other climbers. We've got three or four climbers we can use. Um, uh, sadly, I'm far too old to do it nowadays. My, my leg muscles are far too weak, so I don't do it myself. But there's all sorts of kit. Laurie's brought some of that here as well, which we'll probably show you later on. But there's all sorts of ropes and harnesses and all sorts of stuff. Um, he got me to learn how to belay the other day and he taught Abby how to belay as well. Um, I'm not quite sure what it means, but we seem to do it and didn't fall out the trees. So um, we've got that sort of kit. So that's that answer to that question. Yes, we have specialised kit and we have not only specialised kit, but qualified climbers, which is really important. So Urkep has asked, do you take an emergency kit in the car every single day or only when you're called out to a rescue? I always take emergency kit. It's called a bottle of Bacardi. Um, that goes in the car every day. We have two Volvos, um, one which is for sort of fast response when we don't need any kit, we know we're going out to do something specific, and we have an, another Volvo which is absolutely fully loaded. Some people have big vans and all sorts of things. We actually pile everything we need into the back of Volvo, which you've all seen is incredibly neatly stashed. Well, to be honest, it is neatly stashed when I stash it. You do one rescue and the whole thing's in chaos when we finish the rescue. We've got an awful lot of kit in that car and it will cover probably 99% of the rescues we do. Um, obviously, if we've got to go on a river, we take a boat. If we've got to climb a tree, we take climbing gear, which we don't always take. There is some specialist kit we don't take. Ladders, for instance, we don't take on every rescue. But we have a very comprehensive call sheet. When the receptionist got a call from the member of the public, there's a big list of questions they have to ask. And that gives us a very good idea of what we're going to need for rescue. I think the thing we've introduced over the last couple of years, which is really useful, is if the people can take a picture or a video of the animal in the position it is, because that gives us an even better idea. Obviously, any rescue we get is different. No two rescues have ever been the same. It might be the same sort of incident, but then you've got the animal behaving differently, so that makes it different. Literally, nothing's ever the same, but we've got a very comprehensive rescue kit and a lot of it is to be honest you sort of make it when you need it we've got enough things we can bend and, and, and form and I've even carried coat hangers in the car because you can bend those into all sorts of useful bits of kit and gaffer tape gaffer tape is my favorite thing in the world because if you want a longer pole than you have you can gaffer two poles together and if Laurie's talking too much you just put a large piece over his mouth like that and it's very peaceful for the entire <laughs> rescue it does work um, Abby if she gets she misbehaves, we just gaffer her hands together so she can't move. It, it's useful. Gaffer tape is one of the one big things we use most of the time. But yes, we've got a lot of kit, but it is really down to when you get there, you work out what you want, and if you haven't got it, you make it. Um, it's like rescues itself. Rescuing is a, an art, if you like. Um, I've no idea how to write a book about it. People have asked me to write books about rescuing. I think you've either got it or you haven't. I know I've said this before, but the kit's all there and um, I'm sure Laurie's gonna throw me bits of kit during the evening to tell you more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so Donna Zem has just asked, are all rescuers vets? Uh, very seldom we take a vet with us on a rescue because the rescue is literally that. It's a rescue of the animal. Um, when we get it from where it is, we might need to either bring it back to the center 
or sometimes, which is my favorite type of rescue, we call it a rescue release, where you rescue the animal, it's fine to go straight back out and out it goes. And that's the best type of rescue you can do. So vets don't always go on rescue. Sometimes if we think, or we've seen a picture which shows that something needs stitching up, or we might need a vet with us for certain drugs, then we take a vet with us as well. And our vets work from nine o'clock in the morning till about 10 o'clock at night, seven days a week. So, you know, that's a lot of veterinary cover, but between those hours, it's down to Laurie and I. Laurie basically takes all the calls, and if he wakes me up for something that I don't think is important, he gets into awful trouble. <laughs> uh, so, Fancy has asked, when was the last time you actually cleaned out your car? I clean it, believe it or not, believe it or not, people, I clean it out very regularly. Um, after two or three rescues, at least it's cleaned out but it really doesn't look like it. But we know where everything is, we've got all the bags, labels, we know where to find the bits of kit. And after all these years, we pretty much can put our hands on anything normally in the dark. We've got a huge amount of catch poles at all different lengths, all different strengths. And these poles are very expensive. We've got a, a pole which can reach up 12 meters, which will flick um, an animal off a very high building if we need to flick it off. But I mean, those poles are about sort of 200 pounds each. And I have a tendency when rescues go wrong um, Laurie doesn't often show it, to lose my temper completely, break poles, snap poles, and yep. swear an awful lot. But yeah, kit's expensive. Um, some of the poles we have are, in are incredibly strong, but they're all designed to do certain jobs. So a carbon fiber pole, which we use on a lot of rescues, is great. But if you handle it in a wrong manner, it breaks. So, you know, we have to replace those quite frequently. I think we've got probably 10 catch poles in the car, We've got two or three long whips, all sorts of things. Uh, so, a tat for tasel worm uh, has asked roughly what. Can what's you say the that again? Because I really a like that. A tat for tasel worm. <laughs> a tat for tasel worm. Yeah. Excellent. What a great name. Whoever you are, <laughs> welcome to my world. <laughs> um, they've asked roughly what's the ratio of uh, us attending rescues to animals being brought into the centre by members of the public. Uh, that's very hard. I think more animals are brought in to the to the centre than we go out to rescue. We will always go out to any dangerous animal, so anything we think a member of the public shouldn't handle. So it could be anything from a, a snake to a fox to a badger to a deer. We will go to those because we don't want them picking up an animal which can do them damage. Um, but rescues to public bring them in, I should think, at a guess, and I haven't even been forewarned of this question, is probably about 80% of the animals brought in, 20% of rescued. That would be my guess off the top of my head. Uh, so Fox Musick has just asked, how long have you personally been rescuing animals? All my life. It's been a long, hard, forgetful life. It's great as I get older, because you know, as I forget things going on, you know, I don't, think, I don't remember what happened yesterday. I don't remember what I said five minutes ago. So. I've been rescuing for about five minutes, really, I think, or it could even be 40 years. Um, first rescue I ever did, we won't go into in great depth, but I had no idea. I mean, I hadn't read any books. There's nothing you could read in that time. There's nothing you could really watch in that time to learn how to do rescue. So you just learn it on the job, as it were. And every rescue you do gives you a bit more information for the next rescue you may do sometime in the future. Uh, so we had another question from Attack for Tazel Worm. I know you like that name. Uh, he's asked, is there a minimum education requirement for rescuers? And if so, what is it? Yeah, you could be very stupid like me. Uh, no, it's uh, any rescuer really just needs to have the ability to rescue. You have to think like the animal. You have to be able to react. Sometimes it's not all rushing after something and running around waving your arms in the air. Sometimes you can be very slow. Sometimes you take one step forward, two steps back. It's, it's feel, you have to feel the rescue, you have to really think like the animal if you like, and you have to work out what it might do, what it might not do, what it, if it did that, would it damage itself, if it did that, would it damage itself, and you try to preempt that all the time. It's a real gut feeling, I rescue by gut, and if Laurie and I, Laurie's now a brilliant rescuer to be honest, um, Abby's done run rescue, she put her hand down the chimney and uh, screamed a lot. But I did very well, I got the pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> she got it. She did get the pigeon. But rescuing is just an art, and the we, way to learn probably is to watch the YouTube channel because there's so many hundreds and thousands of rescues on there. You'll get a bit of a feel for it. 
Um, I've now forgotten what the question was, so ask me that question again. Now, Laurie's, Laurie's forgotten what the question was as well. No, it's, uh, is there any education requirement to be education. a rescuer? No, absolutely none. Just a passion, a will. You've got to be quite creative. You need a creative mind to work out how to do a rescue. Laurie and I did a rescue yesterday, which is another story, but we didn't have never had a rescue like it in our lives before. Um, and you then have to work out what you're going to do at the time. But we have enough kit that we can change, gaffer together, chain together, whatever, um, to do the job. Interesting enough, wasn't teaching future rescuers the reason why we actually started filming in the first place many years ago? That's a lorry question. I, you can see from his expression that's a lorry <laughs> question. Um, we did film rescues for that reason. We had so many people come to us saying, we want to learn how to rescue. And the trouble is, we get a call... Within four minutes of that call, we're out on that rescue. So if somebody's coming from even half a mile away, they wouldn't make it because we are very, very fast response on rescues, and that's 24 hours a day. So the only way to teach them is to let them see some of the rescues we've done, and then I can obviously talk it through afterwards. We can do what we call a director's cut, and I can explain what was going on in my mind. I try on YouTube to do that some of the time, but when I'm really concentrating on the rescue, everything else is out of my head. I'm so focused on trying to get that animal to do what I, you know, to get it into a position of safety that I don't always remember to speak. But we could always do a director's cut on rescues, so perhaps we'll do some director's cuts, which nobody will watch. It'll be a total waste of time, but never mind. <laughs> uh, so we've had a few donations that have come in already, so thank you very much to every single one of you that has donated. Uh, Lanny and Lucy's donated two euros, so thank you very much. And Scottish astronomer, who is actually one of our regulars on this stream, has donated £10 and has asked, what's the best equipment to catch live birds that their cat occasionally brings into the house? Can they use a net? Is there any um, preferred method of doing it? You could train your cat to bring them back to you like, like a retrieving animal. No, I mean, a net's probably, most of the time, is the thing we use for birds. Um, but then when you get it on the ground, I think the thing is not to panic. Once you get it and it's contained, don't rush to grab hold of the bird. Once the net's down on the ground, and it could be a net this big, it could be a net twice as big, it could be a net half as big. And um, once you've got that and you've done that, then you've got time. Once the animal's safe, you don't have to rush. You don't have to rush to put it in a box. You don't have to rush to do anything. Just take it steady. Make the rescue go at the pace you want it to go at, not at the pace the animal would like it to go at. God, that was quite deep for me, really. <laughs> it was, very, very profound. I'm getting very profound in my old age. <laughs> uh, we should also say as well that many of you who've watched this before will know Sven. Uh, he's one of our regular... We don't have to talk about Sven. No, Sven, we don't talk about no. Sven tonight. He's not watching. He's not here. <laughs> he's donated his 100 euros, which is he actually has. 100 quid because it's parity at the moment. So thank you, Sven, very much. But... I don't need to be nice to Sven because he's not watching, <laughs> listening or anything. But we are yeah, going to see him at some point quite right soon. We are. He's coming to see us this Friday. Friday. He's, he's coming, coming down to, to visit us Friday. this Friday. Oh, I'll, I'll give him a couple of minutes, that's all, <laughs> before we have a row. I row with everybody. I only like animals. I don't like people. <laughs> um, so we've had a couple of people that have asked, what's the most violent or insane animal you've ever tried to rescue? Are there any ones that you really worry for your own health when you're actually trying to rescue it? Abby can be quite contentious sometimes, quite difficult to deal with. Laurie goes off in his funny mood, so we have to deal with that as well. Um, no, I mean, you could get a really cantankerous crow. You could get a really vicious badger. Animals behave very differently. That's why no two rescues are ever the same. You might get a fox that really lets you do what you need to do to save it. You might get others which will fight you all the way. So cantankerous animals yes you get them I mean you've got to remember when you try to rescue a wild animal it's never probably seen or be that close to a human being before um, and it thinks it's being threatened I mean the animals have the three F's which is one of my favorite expressions and I've got to get this right before I completely get blacked out and I get bleeped on the thing we've got flee which is their first option freeze which is their second option and fight which is their last option um, and there's, there's the three F's basically um, and you never know which of the three they're going to do. So you've got to be ready for it. You've got to preempt. You've got to think again, as I say, like the animal. You've got to think like the animal, work out what it's going to do, and try to stop it doing anything that could do it damage. That's what it's all about, guys. 
Uh, so Jay Eagles has asked, do you rescue snakes such as adders or slow worms or any of the other species we get in this country um, often? Um, we don't do that many snakes. We do some. Um, the only, I mean, slow worms, which aren't snakes, we rescue reasonably frequently. We rescue grass snakes probably the most because we're in a grass snake area. We're not particularly in an adder area, which they, they like the sandy, sandy soil, but we do some adders as well. Um, obviously when we're abroad and we're going to Australia or somewhere else, we rescue skates, which snakes which scare the life out of me because, you know, I rescued one in Australia years and years ago as a copperhead. And the guy said, well, if that had bitten you, you'd be dead. I went, oh, great, absolutely lovely. Any snakes in the UK aren't gonna hurt you. Um, an adder might give you a bite, it's unlikely, um, but it's not gonna hurt you that much. Um, if your dog gets bitten by an adder, you should take it to a vet but even then it's not likely to be life-threatening and obviously slow worms just look at you and blink. That's quite easy. So yeah, snakes we do a few times a year. The only thing that slow um, grass snakes do particularly is they, they do leave a horrible smell on your hands for days. However, many times you wash your hands after you've rescued a grass snake, um, you're gonna smell of garlic for about three or four days and it's a bit of an unpleasant smell, which is one of their protections. Grass snake, easy to recognize. If it's got a yellow collar around its neck, it's likely to be a grass snake. If it's got big zigzags down its back, it's going to be an adder, so be a bit more careful. Uh, so Urkep has asked, is there any equipment that you bring for yourselves or other rescuers, just in case anyone's injured? Do we have a first aid kit in the car? I bring cigarettes, I bring loo paper, I bring lots of chocolates, and many, many Diet Cokes. <laughs> um, that is my rescue kit. For us, all we have is some hand wipes in the car afterwards if we got very messy or very dirty or might have sort of picked up a load of lice or something horrible, we sort of wipe our hands down. But no, um, we've got Laurie with us. He's a qualified first aider. Um, and if I die, I just want to see the time he's going to have to give me mouth to mouth because although I'll be unconscious, I would have laughed if I'd been conscious. <sighs> yeah. Uh, we do actually have very basic first aid kits in both cars just in case someone gets a cut or anything like that. Um, nothing massively excessive, just sort of deal with uh, certain eventualities. Um, Urkef has also asked, is there anything you'd recommend um, that members of the public take in their car on a daily basis just in case they, they come across an injured animal? Lawyer's been briefing about me about this all day and I've forgotten everything he said. But I think we need a cage. You need a basic cage, um, which can be a foldable cage, or it can be just in many cases, it can be a cardboard box, just something to contain the animal and keep it safe and quiet. Um, you need a pair of gloves, always useful if you've got something that can be a bit more vicious, even a hedgehog. Um, you know, you need a pair of gloves because they're quite spiky. Don't try to ever rescue an animal that you're not confident of. So do not go for a deer, do not go for a badger, do not even go for a fox unless you're very very confident. I mean, I've had a friend of mine, Sean, who's been a rescuer for many years, got really bitten badly by a fox a few years ago because um, he caught it, he let slip, and he tried to grab it with a, an ungloved hand, and it gave him a very nasty bite. I've been bitten once or twice by a fox, um, and it really, really hurt. So if you're not confident, don't do it. Stand back, don't stress the animal out, but ring somebody who knows what they're doing because we have for 40 years pretended to know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think we get it right most of the time. Um, so the, the other items that we'd usually recommend to have in a car kit, um, a towel. Okay, I forgot that. I just yeah. went off on a little tangent, the, guys. This is the kit that you said. A towel, um, a good torch. We actually have some really good um, head torches called Boric torches. They're not expensive. I think they're 10 or 15 quid. You can wear them on the head, which keeps your hands free. Um, and that is really very useful for us. We also have, we built or made ourselves some little red filters for the front of those. So if you've got an animal that's very stressed, you can actually put a red light on, which animals aren't nearly so scared of. So we do that. So we've got gloves, we've got a cage, we've got torches. What else did we say? Like a towel, maybe to grab something, probably. Basic sort of cutting Basic maybe stuff. a scissor, or yeah, scissor, some wire scissors. cutters, or something just in case. Uh, but that's really all you need. That's all you need, all you need. But we have quite a lot more in our car. <laughs> Uh, we've had, actually had Darren who just said that he has all that in his car already. Uh, thankfully he hasn't had to use it there uh, yet, but it's there just in case, which is always nice to hear. Absolutely. Well done, Darren. Don't get hurt, man. <laughs> Don't get hurt. 
So, um, if we now we're going to go over some of the bits of rescue kit that we use more on a regular basis. Uh, so I'm just going to talk some of it through, what it's used for. Um, I have no like idea that. what any of our kits used for. So somebody pass a bit of kit. We'll start off. We've got probably the most common one. Here on the conveyor belt is a pair of gloves. <laughs> a pair of gloves. Don't forget the pair of gloves. Um, quite sturdy, quite strong. Not ridiculously strong. You you need to feel. I mean, there's some animals you can't actually grip with gloves. You put a pair of gloves on, you can't grip them tight enough, so you have to go barehanded. What I use gloves for a lot, um, which Laurie will have seen and Abby will have seen as well. If you're with an animal, you're not quite sure how it's going to behave. Hold the gloves like that and just stroke the animal on the back end of the animal. You can see what it's going to do. You get a feel as whether it's going to try to turn around and grab them like crazy, or whether it's just going to be quite still. If it doesn't do too much there is a possibility you could grab it without the gloves. So although you wear the gloves sometimes, sometimes you just stroke the animal gently to calm it down and you can get a, a feeling of how it's gonna to behave to you when you do try and grab it. So multi-use gloves, thrown away. Next item, <laughs> this is what I use for Laurie when he's misbehaving, it's a grasp. They're heinously expensive. Um, they're over a hundred pounds. Um, it is a quick release grasper which you don't particularly need but it's quite useful and, and it grabs the animals. Any tool you use is fine if you use it correctly. I mean you could use one of these and you could strangle an animal if you were an idiot. You could get it so tight that it can't breathe. Um, I never have any graspers that, that lock off. I'm going to move this down the other end because graspers can lock off. You can turn that and that locks it solid. I never use that. I always keep that fluid. So if I think the animal's struggling, I can just let that off and let the pressure off a little bit. Graspers are great. You can make them. I made one for Laurie the other day. He was, he's such a fussy little devil. And he wanted mm -hmm. a posh one. So I made oh, him I one, gonna buy one out of a broom remember? handle, two bicycle handlebar grips, and some wire like this, plastic coated wire, which you can buy at B&Q. I think the whole thing cost me a tenner. So instead of a hundred quid plus, you get a perfectly adequate grasper for about 10 pounds. Um, you haven't got the quick release, but you don't need it. All you've got to do is flick that back through very quickly and it gives you lots of gap. The animal can get out or will get out by itself and no problem. So grasp is something we use an awful lot of um, and I use it for Laurie. I hit him on the head with that bit when he gets <laughs> too lippy. Interesting though, we've had a few people asking, do grasspers actually hurt foxes when you're using them? Anything we, anything we use can hurt. I mean, if you use the swan hook wrong, you could break a swan's neck. If you use a grasper wrong, you could throttle it, you could do it damage. It's knowing how to use the kit. It's not just having the kit, it's knowing how to use it. Again, think like the animal. If you had that grasp around your throat and you couldn't breathe, you're always gonna show signs of that so you can slacken it off. Think, use your head. I've got a great expression. Laurie bought me a T-shirt a while ago, <coughs> which I'm not allowed not to wear outside yeah. the office. It's hooked up in the office and it's, it's not something, something rocket science. It's not rocket science, it's using your head, it's using your imagination, your creativity. All those things together allow you to rescue wild animals sensibly and safely. So any bit of kit can be dangerous, but if you use it right, it's not. So on that note, uh, the next bit of kit. This is my nose picker. If I want to pick my nose, I can pick my nose with it. It's a swan hook. Um, it's how you grab a swan. Obviously, if you try to grab the swan for two, as uh, two things with this really, if you grab it and you twist it sideways, it's going to break the swan's neck. And if you if you grab it sideways, it could break the, the the catching rod as well. So that goes on the end of a rod, which can be up to sort of two or three meters long, and you can hook the swan. It's a straight, gentle pull back to where you are. Don't try to do any more than that. And as soon as you can get the swan with your hand, that's far better than being in this. So this is a swan hook. You can buy them, they're quite expensive. We make ours ourselves, it's just a bit of alley rod with a thread on one end and bent like that the other end. We've got big fat ones for swans, we've got thinner ones for geese, so we actually make them as we want them and create our own shapes. Not expensive to make yourselves, all you've got to do is buy a tap and die to make the thread bit on the end. I'll throw that on the floor now. Listen to this guys, finish with that bit. <laughs> Uh, so the next bit of kit we actually talked briefly about earlier. We've done this. I've done this. I've held this up before. Look, I'm on soft focus, guys. I'm on <laughs> soft focus. It's a net. Um, we use those a lot. Um, it can contain things. It can stop things going where you don't want them to go just by putting it in front of it to turn it back. 
Um, you don't always have to grab the animal on the first shot. We went out to a sparrow hawk the other day, um, which was had a bad wing, it had a broken wing, but you know it was not going where I wanted it to go. So instead of trying to catch it and make it go somewhere else, I pushed it back to where I knew I could get it, where it was safe, got it into a corner, and we managed to get it that way. So yeah, you can get it in a net. Um, if you get a duck in a net, it's quite likely to dive away from you, so it's not going to work so much. But there's multiple uses for all these bits of kit, to be honest. So that is a net <laughs> on the floor. Uh, so one of our more specialist bits of kit now. Uh, this might not be immediately obvious, but it's something we it's picked up phone. a couple of years ago. Hello, who's calling? Hello, is somebody calling my mobile <laughs> Hello. Oh, it's not. It's a FLIR. Um, it's a heat detection camera. It's very useful for us when we go out either day or night. If you can't see the animal, there's a chance you could pick up a thermal image of the animal in the shrubbery where it is or in a hedge or behind something. Quite useful, it won't shoot through trees or very thick foliage, but it's quite useful if you can't see an animal, but it's there. And it's amazing how quiet animals can be. It's amazing how they can sidle away from you and they're actually very close, but you can't see them or hear them. Um, this might pick it up. We've also got, apart from this, we've got an infrared camera. So if we are out at night and we can't see something, we've got infrared as well. So FLIR for heat detection and uh, infrared for, for exactly that. We can see something at night if we need to. Uh, so on the same grounds as cameras, we have a couple of these. He's keeping me going tonight. It's all going too fast tonight. I'll get um, fired later. This is a drain cam. Or in Laura's case, it's an orifice cam. If he upsets me, I threaten to do sort of certain medical procedures to him with this. It is incredibly useful. Um, it gets us into very tight corners to see something. So we, if, you know, we want to get down into a hole or we want to see something going on, it's got an internal light in there, so it will light as you go. And we can see what's going on. We use this, Abby, actually when Abby did the pigeon, um, we used this to find out where the pigeon was so we knew roughly where to grab it. And it's quite, it's a very useful piece of kit. They're not that expensive. From memory, I think they're about 50 or 60 quid, I think. That much about I can't remember now. How much? That much about 100. That's okay. Right. We've got a posh one because we're posh people. Um, it's about 100 quid, but very useful. Um, you know, you can look down places or look around corners or do all sorts of things with this. Very useful piece of kit for catching things and knowing where it is. So knowing what you've got to do to catch it in the end. Very useful. Uh, but do remember, guys, which we often forget, charge it up when you finish with it, because next time, next time you go out, if the battery's flat, that's when I hurl it across the room at Laurie, saying, I'm very, very angry, Mr. Brady. <laughs> so I'll put that down. I won't even, I won't even throw that down. Uh, so the next bit of kit is one that many of you are, are very fond of. It's a Ku Klux Klan hat, isn't it? Put it on your head and it's a Ku Klux Klan. Um, it's a swan bag. It's made actually by people who make sails. So this is made out of some sail material. Um, we get them bought for us. They're, they're in cows. They are. Look, they're called. They're called. Rattisley and Lamthorn sail makers cows on the Isle of Wight. Um, useful bags. Works for us. People have different types of swan carriers. This to us we quite quite like. We get the swan into it. Swans can't go backwards once they're in there, so we then put the swan in, and when we want to release the swan, we just unzip it, and off the swan goes. So it's swan bag, another one thrown on the floor. <laughs> so they are custom made, they're about £60 per unit. We've got a number of different ones in various states of repair or disrepair. Um, another probably one of Actually, I'm just stopping. I'm pieces. stopping Laurie there very quickly, because you can't get a swan bag or you haven't got one. A lot of people use those big IKEA bags. Um, again, they work perfectly adequately. Put any animal in that. When, if you remember going back on the YouTube videos, um, Laurie was 70 foot up a tree. Yeah. I was wetting myself, terrified that Laurie was going to kill himself. That's what I was going to say to his mum. But we threw up to him a sort of a big IKEA type bag, um, or a small compost bag, and that's what he put the swan in to bring it down safely. So again, all this kit has multiple uses. You might think it's for that, but actually you can use it for other things as well. Laurie's now got another, another something in his hand. <laughs> uh, a pair of wire cutters. Okay, wire cutters, fences. Um, these are good for very thick wire, very heavy duty wire, but a pair of just normal side cutters, pliers, will do a lot of fences. These are going through the, the sort of thick stuff like barbed wire. 
um, they'll cut those as well. So wire cutters are always useful. Um, but you also you need a pair of scissors if you're going through a football net or something like that. A pair of scissors is quite adequate and all you need. But always think when you're cutting through close to an animal, make sure the, the, the point or the cutting bit isn't going to damage animal skin. So we always make sure we're against the animal skin but facing away from it. So when we do cut, it's not going to cut into the animal. All sorts of things. Laurie's at I've got my shopping bag now. So this is just a little mesh bag. Um, I'm sure it's used for cats and small dogs and all sorts of things. We use it for ducklings actually here a lot of the time. Um, you put a fox in that, it'll probably take about three minutes to cut, come out of this. But a cage is great. A little bag like this is great for birds because it's nice and soft. The bird is not going to do its, damp its feathers any damage. So an owl, anything from an owl to a buzzer to anything else could go in a bag like that. We carry that all the time. We've probably got a couple of them on board at any one time. And obviously food, we always forget to say that. We've always got a few tins of dog food in the car. And we've also got a few um, big pots of corn in the car because we want to entice a swan into us when we're on a swan rescue. Sprinkle a bit of corn down. The nice thing about corn rather than bread, which you shouldn't use anyway really for swans, is the corn will sink to the bottom. So the swan will have to put its head into the water to get the corn. And while it's not looking at you and can't see you, you can get the swan hook behind it. So it's a bit sneaky, guys. It's a bit sneaky. But uh, if the swan can't see you, um, then it's gonna, you're going to get a chance of catching it. Often on rescues, um, if we want to get an animal and it's looking at the rescuer, we get somebody else to go into shot from a different angle. So it then transfers attention to someone else. It gives you rescue the chance to get closer without being seen. So like the swan ducking its head in the water, if you've got a duck looking at you, if you can get somebody else in shot, then you may be able to come up behind it to grab it and do the necessary. Uh, so that's a bit of a brief overview on probably our most common used items. There are an awful lot more, but we'd need about a week to go through everything that's in the car. Uh, if you do have any questions on any of the bits that Simon's just discussed, please send them in uh, and we'll see what we can do. Um, just going back to some of the questions that we've had in whilst we've been discussing that. Armpit Furs has asked, um, what do you think is your most embarrassing rescue? Uh, and he loves watching you volunteer me to go up trees. <laughs> embarrassing rescues? I can't, I'm trying to think of an embarrassing rescue. There's obviously times when I miss things which I shouldn't have missed and I kick myself violently for missing things which I shouldn't miss. Um, embarrassing, we've never really come very unstuck on a rescue. Sometimes we miss something once or twice and we have to go in for the third or fourth time slightly embarrassing because it means we cocked it up. When you've got a sparrowhawk sort of 11 metres up in a warehouse, sometimes you get it in the net as you try to bring the nets down together because the way of doing that, Laurie and I have perfected a way over the years. You get it in the net, you pin it against something, but then as you try to drag, come out with it and grab the animal down, the bird down, it's going to come out. So we slide another net up to the other net. So the nets are like that together. And then we bring both nets down together and we've developed quite a, a nifty art of getting uh, birds down like that. Um, so yes, we do have embarrassed things, I'm sure. I mean, I know on occasions we've, we've caught a sparrow hawk, got it in the net, and then trying to bring it down, passing over something or going over a drain pipe or something, it's come out and we have to go for it again. Um, I don't like doing that because it's gonna stress the bird out more. The whole idea on any rescue is not to stress the animal out more than you really, really have to. Because that animal's gonna be scared. It's nearer to human than it's ever been and it doesn't want to be so try and make it quick concise but don't rush it don't go in like a bull in a china shop uh, cats and dogs has asked are any of the materials donated or do we buy all the rescue kit that we've got um, <clears throat> very few bits in the older days when people weren't so mean with money um, we did get some kit donated not a lot uh, we buy most of the kit we need and we suddenly think of something that we want but we make a lot of our kit too because if you make it, it's exactly how you want it to be. It's made the way you want it to work. Um, so we make a lot of our kit as well. So yeah, it's, donations do come in. I can't think of any on rescue kit that have been donated offhand, but um, we have had kit donated in the past. Um, so speaking of donations, we've had a few in um, as we've been talking. Viv Thank E you. has donated 10 pounds. 
and it's written, Hi wildlife team, thank you for helping the animals, I love your work, God bless. So thank you very much. It's actually us who should bless you because without your money, without your donations, we couldn't do what we do. Everybody says to me, you know, what's it all about, animals or the money? And I always upset everybody by saying the money because the more money we get, the more animals we can save, the more animals we can deal with. So it is about the money because we need that money to help the animals. So donations are great, membership's great, you can adopt an animal with us, which is great as well. And obviously the thing which I, everybody gets, gets funny when I talk about it is legacies. They're the big ones. Legacies at the end of the day, it might not come in for many, many years, but you know, 20 years down the line, what you leave to a charity will make an amazing difference. Uh, we've also had 10 US dollars donated by Nils Norman, uh, who's written, sometimes they get birds crashing into the window, uh, they've got no wildlife rescue around, what is the right thing to do if the bird is hurt? Um, it's hard to know, obviously, it's like people saying, we've got this bird or we've got this animal that's in trouble, can you tell us what's wrong with it? You cannot diagnose over the telephone, it is impossible. <coughs> any doctor, any vet will tell you that. Um, so the best thing you can do for anything like that, if it does crash into a window, put it somewhere warm, dark and quiet for a couple of hours. So away from people, away from noise. And if after two hours you open the box, it flies off, whatever, that's great. If it's still in trouble and can't fly off, then obviously it needs to go into a wildlife hospital um, to be looked at and obviously have x-rays or certainly have a thorough examination. So yeah, the first thing you do with any animal is warm, dark and quiet. People bring things in, sometimes to us, which they just caught, they just found. We probably won't do anything for at least 20 minutes. And they say, oh, well, do something, do something. We leave it warm, dark and quiet, just to settle back down. With deer rescues, for instance, you get a deer on the ground and it's stressed, it can't stand up, it can't do anything. <coughs> just wait for 20 or 30 minutes. Sometimes they have to get their brain back into gear to stand up and run away again. So give an animal time, don't rush it. If you think you'd hurt your leg and you didn't know what was going on, you want a bit of time just to sort it out in your own mind as to how you're gonna deal with it. So very good. Um, we also tend to have a rule, if there aren't any wildlife rescues around near you, uh, try and take it into your local vets. Most of them will help injured wildlife as well, and it's a lot better than just leaving it out there to suffer. Um, so, question from Sarah, who's asked, we've expressed frustration before about people being one of the biggest problems for wildlife. Uh, if there's one thing you could stop people from doing, what would it be? Breeding. Um, <laughs> I should probably get into a lot of trouble for that comment. True, is the human population is too great for the size of the planet. And we won't get into the big planetary picture too much because I can preach about that for hours and hours. Um, mankind has become too selfish, become too greedy, too self-centered, too inward looking. We've got to change our minds and we've got to change the way we think and the way we deal with wildlife. We actually need an intact food chain for us as well. Everybody thinks, let's save the elephants, let's save the tigers, let's save the big animals. But if the food chain breaks at the bottom, then all the animals above that creature will suffer long term. So it's got to be, it's a big picture because it's got to be a holistic repair, really. You've got to save them all. You can't just save one species. And actually, it's the species which aren't that sexy. It's the invertebrates, it's the smaller animals, which allow all the bigger animals to survive. So, yeah, too many people. We have too many people on this planet, and one day somebody's going to bite the bullet and it's going to be a hard bullet to bite, guys. Ah, uh, sadly. Um, a couple of people in the comments have also mentioned that you can actually get stickers that you can put on windows to prevent birds flying into them, which is always a good idea. Um, sort of doesn't, but sometimes works. We've had them on our windows before when we've got blue tits who are particularly keen on the putty on the side of the windows, and they just think it's another bird, they go and chat to it. Um, you've just got to suck it and see. You've got to see what works, what doesn't. Sometimes these things work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes people put sort of um, bits of silver foil up, bits of string across, whatever. Um, the animals can be, do the most peculiar things, but not as peculiar as people. <laughs> uh, so we've had three more don donations come in over the past couple of minutes, and all from the same person, one you might recognise, which is Nigel Grant. That Nigel Grant, he's, no, we don't like Nigel this year. He raised £10,000 for last year. He's an absolute star. Now he's raising it for someone else. So we don't talk to Nigel Grant. We put our nose in the air and walk the other side of the street. 
Nigel, you're a star man. Just keep keep going for the animal charities. Um, we're not the only animal charity out here, and any charity that deals with animals deserves respect, and you certainly give an inordinate amount of time trying to save animals by fundraising for all sorts of different charities. So you are a star, and thank you for these extra donations that I gratefully receive, and I'm still not gonna sell the wildlife stamps you gave me because I love them too much. They're on the top of my desk in cellophane, and I will never let them go. When they start to go out into the general public, you'll know that I pop my clogs in a, in a coffin. <laughs> uh, Cats and Dogs has asked, what's the weirdest tool you've ever had to improvise with? Oh, there's been so many guys. I think one of the, probably one of the weirdest ones is we had a, a magpie had a nest, was it magpie or jackal or something had a nest in a chimney, but we went up to the top of the roof, we looked down and the nest was about 12 feet down in the chimney and we couldn't get it out so I, I asked the lady she had a soup ladle and she did so we got a soup ladle we bent it totally out of shape and put it on the end of one of our very long catch poles gaffer taped it on which is why the gaffer tapes were so useful and we managed to scoop the young bird into the soup ladle and brought it up that way so improvisation is the spice of life <laughs> it's quite a good story, though. I've never heard that. Oh, no, well, there. See, Abby hadn't heard that one. She <laughs> hasn't been here long enough, so she'll be using the soup ladle next week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, a couple of people have asked. Now, we've actually answered one of these before, but just because we've had uh, several people ask it. Um, do you or anyone else often get injured during rescues? Uh, and if so, are they serious? I always say that. If a wildlife rescuer gets injured, it's because he's done it wrong or he's been stupid or he hasn't thought and he hasn't thought through what he's doing. This is why a lot of rescues, you don't have to rush into them. You don't have to go panicking down some cliff without thinking what you're going to do. All you should be thinking about is the welfare of the animal. And to make that work, you've got to think of your welfare as well because you've got to rescue the animal. So if you fall down a cliff or go and damage yourself, then you're not going to help the animal at all. Um, I'd been got a couple of times. I grabbed a deer once and it ripped the shirt off my back. I've had an antler in my side of my neck. I've had an antler in my forehead because it was my stupidity. I mean, deer can be very strong. And even if you grab the antlers, what I do when I grab antlers, if it's a male, um, you grab the antlers with the, the gloves on, you put your thumb over the end of the antlers. So even if it does come towards you, your thumb is going to hit you before the antler does. Um, think think very carefully and work out how you're going to do something. If you get hurt, if you get bitten, because you've done it wrong, um, it does happen very occasionally, and thank God I say very occasionally, because I've never been that seriously hurt. I've had a few swear words when I've been bitten, but that's about as bad as it gets. <laughs> uh, a couple of people who have been has, does the equipment that we have, the gloves and things like that, do they prevent injuries, or is there a, a lot of um, knowledge and knowing the animal that needs to be done to avoid that. And I think the knowledge of the animal is the most important. I mean, gloves, as I said to you, when you wear gloves, you wear other wear gloves, you might just stroke the animal with a pair of gloves to see how it's going to react. You want to get a reaction from the animal, work out what it's going to do to know whether you can go in without a glove on and scruff it, because that's, for foxes, it's the easiest way to grab them, but you don't want to get bitten. So just see how the animal's going to behave, get a feel. And, you know, if you grab an animal on the neck, maybe not start on it. Once you've done the glove trick, you just sort of put the gloves up a bit further towards its head, and if that's going all right, you then slide your ungloved hand in to do the same thing, and then you can scruff it at the last minute. But you get one chance at a scruff. The only thing I would say is never try to scruff an adult badger, because they ain't got no scruff. They just <laughs> haven't got anything, so you have to be really careful. But with badgers, for instance, everybody will try to put them in a grasper. <coughs> Any animal in a grasper is gonna fight for its life, because he thinks you're trying to kill it, obviously, you're gonna strangle it. So often if you just put a cage in front of a badger um, and have the door open and you get a towel and you put it behind the badger and you just very gently walk it in, um, it will often do it. It sounds insane, but it will often do it. It will go into a dark place where it thinks it's safe without you having to get a, a badger and a grasp. Badger and a grasp is a dangerous thing to see. They can be nearly dead and they will fight with every ounce of their strength and it's really very unpleasant. Why cause that stress when you don't need to? Do it very gently. Laurie and I many times have walked ducks into keep nets. And again, rather than trying to catch the duck and get nets flying around, leave the keep net there, get the ducks in the right position, and very slowly, even if it takes you an hour, 
walk it into the keep net and you can get mum and babies, which is often the case, or a whole family in the keep net at once, just gently. You do not need, in a lot of instances, to rush, rush a rescue. Sometimes you do, but just think about the rescue, think about what you're going to do, and you can often take your time to get it right. Uh, we've had a couple of people in the chat saying they're actually having difficulties donating via the Super Chat at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, uh, YouTube seems to be having an issue with it. Uh, it is working for some people if you keep trying, um, but if you are worried or anything like that and you do very kindly want to make us a donation, uh, we've just left in the comments a link to our donation page. Uh, you can donate from anywhere on anywhere in the world over there, and if you do have a problem, just let us know and we can try and sort another way. Uh, to do it. And your money makes all the difference to our success, to be honest. Without you, we wouldn't be here. And rather like our volunteers, we've got 375 volunteers. Without them, I wouldn't be here because we couldn't handle it. So everybody plays their part and you can play your part by giving us money to help us save the animals as the volunteers give inordinate amount of hours. I mean, we work from nine in the morning till 10 or 11 at night, sometimes midnight uh, before we get our volunteers to go home and then obviously we do rescues during the night as well so it really makes a difference don't think you can't help and if you can't give now just click onto the website tomorrow and help us that way because we really will appreciate it we probably don't thank people enough for their generosity but it is really heartfelt it is vital to us and so wonderful to get it thank you yeah, uh, we actually survive absolutely entirely on public donations. We don't get any money from the government or from anyone else. So we can only keep doing what we do thanks to your generosity. So all of what we can do, every video, every rescue we've done, um, it's because of you guys. So thank you very much. Didn't see my lips move once during that whole <laughs> sentence, did you? It was amazing. Yeah. We haven't made Abby talk tonight yet. She thinks she's got away with it. But has she? <laughs> only time will tell. Uh, Daryl Tunwarm has asked, do you keep track of the, the young animals that we release, so foxes and badgers, each year? <coughs> we monitor as much as we can. I am just waiting for the day when you can sort of put in a microchip type size um, tracking device and track the animals. I would love to track more animals. I will not put collars around them. I will not put harnesses on them because I think it's just going to impede their success in the wild. Um, but we do obviously the badges we release we keep a track on because they are microchips so if something happens to one we can see if it's one of ours um, same with foxes same with hedgehogs we track them as best we can and quite successfully because we know where they're going we did a big survey a few years ago with 50 hedgehogs which did have radio transmitters on them because they were just stuck on the spines and I don't mind that because it doesn't impede their progress um, and that worked very well and to me if an animal gets back into the wild and lives for six weeks or more, ideally six months, that's got to be a successful release for us. So when we can get these bits of kit, which don't cost a fortune and a half, we will try and track more. But we're pretty sure that work we do is successful and the animals make it through to have a real life in the wild. Uh, interesting enough, we, we do have um, little RFID chips in some of the animals that we uh, have released and our local badger group have RFID reading gates that they can put over certain badger sets uh, and I believe it was last year maybe the year before uh, we actually had some of our badgers that we'd released two years prior uh, pop up on that doing really well uh, that just moved back into another set so that's always nice to see because usually we don't see the outcome once an animal is uh, back in the wild. Laura is a bit like the Encyclopedia Britannica. He never forgets anything. He's got a photographic. I forget everything. He, he forgets things I ask him to do every day, like the cameras up in top flight. Has he mended those yet? No. Has he moved the camera up by the top incinerator? No. But then silly things he remembers. He's very strange like that. Our Laurie is very strange, like everybody at Wildlife End. <laughs> Uh, a couple of people are asking, do you require a credit card to donate? Uh, no, you don't. You can donate via credit cards, debit cards, uh, or PayPal on the website. If you did have another way, um, so a check or anything like that, you can send a check to um, the center. We have the address at the bottom of our website. Um, but any way that you can think of, we can probably find a way to make we it work. We will take your money, whatever, wherever, however. <laughs> um, there's a you left me a couple of bits. I've got to thank I've got to thank Alice, haven't I? Alice, Alice was going home tonight because she had some stuff to do with her animals. 
Um, I don't think she did get home tonight, but she's always there. She's probably typing away now for all we know. I don't know whether Abby knows whether she's mm -hmm. she she's, is, yeah. she's yes. typing yeah. away. Is she she's still here or not? Um, I think she's at home. This is, she's working, working from home in her own time. See, the other secret thing we've got here, we've got 60 CCTV cameras. And everybody <laughs> thinks it's so I can spy on the volunteers. But actually, we have cameras in most of the animal pens. So if an animal's in trouble, we can go in. If it's not in trouble, we say, well, clear. But by watching the animals in the pens, I can also keep an eye on Alice and various other volunteers to make sure they're doing what they should be doing. It's a useful way. I mean, I wish more centres used CCTV because it no stress to the animal. If it's having a fit or it's on a drip and the drip stops, you can see it on the CCTV. If it's in trouble, you can see on the CCTV. Don't keep going in to check it personally. We go in to clean them and to feed them. We make our, our confrontation with the animal as brief as possible and then step back and let them do their own thing. Uh, a couple of people still having issues with donations. Um, Lol Dongs has actually just said that they've thrown money at the screen um, and are waiting to see if that works. Just come and throw it in my pocket. I'm here, <laughs> the door is always open. Come and throw money at me and I will smile like a Cheshire cat. Um, if it does work, we'll let you know in the next um, live stream. But uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to manage to, to make its way down here. But that's a fantastic idea. Uh, We've got to thank, who we've got to thank? We've got to thank Fancy. Fancy, yes. you said, talk about Fancy, you said to me. She did she, some artwork for us of a swan. Was it a swan? It was a swan. It was a swan and it was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Watching could, as well. If you could do us another 500 of those in the next few <laughs> months, that would be lovely. Interesting um, enough, in the chat earlier, um, Fancy actually said that they would like to draw a swan in a swan bag. So we shall try and provide you a decent picture of a swan in a swan bag that you can work from. I'll just put Laurie in the swan bag and you can see GI him out and put a swan in his place. But he will wiggle when he's in the swan bag, I dare say. But thanks so much for that. Stunning. I, you know, it, it's, it's a great thing to be able to draw like that. I can't draw for toffees, which is a great shame in my life. I can only be creative in this one thing and that's saving wildlife, which I love and I wouldn't change it for the world. So that's what I do. You do what you do. Fantastic. And thank you very much indeed. Uh, Funny Cat has asked two questions. The first is, are your vets always on standby at any time of the day? Uh, and the second is, what do the volunteers actually do at the centre? The volunteers work like absolute demons. If somebody said to me, you know to go and work at a wildlife centre, you'll be going in at nine o'clock in the morning, you'll be cleaning out poo, cleaning out cages, um, getting muck off animals, I'd say no thank you. Our volunteers are amazing. I mean, they do everything from feeding the babies, feeding the adults, providing food, providing enrichment. I mean, anything that needs doing here is done, and it's done by 375 volunteers. We still need more. We still have some shifts which are very short, and bearing in mind that we work three shifts a day, seven days a week, it's nine till one, one till six, six till whatever, usually 10 o'clock, this could be later, um, and it's seven days a week. So if you've got any time spare and can give a regular commitment we really, really still need you. Don't ever think we've got enough volunteers because we haven't. Poor Alice used to have a full head of lustrous hair and now the hair's getting very wispy as she pulls it out and she can't get enough people on shift. She we get pleading emails every day from Alice saying, this shift's short or that shift's short. Um, you know, wildlife needs you. It needs your love, it needs your attention, it needs your care and it needs your passion. So please, if you can, volunteer yourself or you know anybody down your road who could volunteer just start hitting the drum get people to help us because we really appreciate every single thing you do for us uh, and we do we do work 24 hours a day 365 days a year uh, so any time that you do have off uh, we can pinch it from you so uh, our main shifts are 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. 1 p.m. till 6 p.m. Just and 6 p.m. till whenever the workload finishes. It's usually by 11 or 12, depending on the time of year. Laurie's found his voice. Laurie has spoken. The voice of the Lord has spoken. Uh, a tap for Tazelworm, who you will remember from earlier. A tap for Tazelworm. As it said, uh, do you often work with other rescues or other organisations as part of what we do? Um, we're quite insular. All wildlife aid. All wildlife centres are quite insular purely because they just work 24-7 as we do. Um, we do talk if we really have to. We don't like each other. I'm joking. Um, 
we do our own thing. I mean, that we do help other organisations. They can't get to a rescue and we're nearer. We'll go and do it. Sometimes we call them if they're nearer. But yes, there is a cooperation. Um, we cooperate when we have to, not through any malice, but because we're just doing our own thing and do it all the time. Like, for instance, if we've got an animal in here that's lonely and it needs something to be with, we will ring up another organisation and ask them to take it because we don't want the animal to suffer in its recuperation. We want it to have another one of its own sort next to it. Or equally, they might ring us if we've got uh, one badger cub or lots of badger cubs and they've got one, they'll send that to us as well. So there is a cooperation, begrudging as it may be. Um, um, but yes, we work together when it's important and it works well. Uh, Cats and Dogs has asked, how often do you get imprinted birds or other animals that are raised by uh, someone who unfortunately doesn't really know how to do it properly, but has, with the best intention, tried to help? Oh, this is my pet subject, guys. Um, in my mind, there is never, ever a reason to imprint an animal. No animal will become imprinted unless you imprint it. Now, if it's been with somebody else and somebody's had it for four or five days, there's a lot of work. We can't guarantee 100% we can break that habitual habituation, but 90, 95% of the time we can. So if you know anybody who's got a wild animal and they're keeping it in unnatural conditions or keeping it by itself or they're stroking it or handling it, whatever, please talk to them and tell them to take it to a wildlife centre because we know what we're doing. We're good at not imprinting. I mean, a lot of our work when we get, especially the orphans in, is not imprinting them, which is why we have CCTV, which is why we don't keep going in with the animals. And if somebody <coughs> at a wildlife centre, you get some of them, or you say a vet, oh, it's become imprinted because it's been with us. That's because that's their fault. There is no justification in any wild animal becoming imprinted. And that's a bit of a brave thing to say. I should probably get shot down for that, but I really, really mean it. Um, Donation-wise, we still have people um, that are having issues. Uh, they say they can only do a max for, of all £2. For, pounds. All um, but we've for. had quite a few of those come in. Uh, John Sullivan has donated £1.99 on the chat and has actually donated £50 pounds via PayPal on our website, which is huge. You're a star. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. That's really nice. Uh, Jay Eagles has donated £1.99 and has said, um, love what you do for our environment. That's very kind. Thank you. If everybody donates £1.99 100 times tonight, that'd be really cool and it would make us all sorts. We've got so much coming up with our library. We always have so much on the go. We've got the new centre, which we'll start talking about in bigger terms later. We've got a massive um, child or children's type scheme coming up soon called IDOT. Keep the space open because IDOT will become a big thing. We're hoping it's going to become worldwide. Big things coming up. So we're always not only working in the present, but we're thinking short term, we're thinking long term as well. Um, so yeah, we need your help. All these schemes, all this IDOT scheme, for instance, needs £50,000 to make it work properly. We need somebody to design an app. You might know somebody who makes apps, designs apps, creates apps. You know, any skills you've got are probably useful to us. So don't ever be shy thinking, oh, well, what I can give is nothing. If you're an app designer or whatever, anything like that, please talk to us. We would love to talk to you and get things going. It's really important. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who think they can't help. Um, one person can do an awful lot. If lots of people do a little bit, that creates the big thing. Hence IDOP, which more later on. Uh, so a few more donations. Marie <coughs> donated two euros. But, uh, she loves the bats and all the advice that we give out, so thank you. Uh, Prodigy has donated uh, two euros twice. Um, I believe he said in the chat he was trying to do 20. So thank you very much for just that. Just keep going, just keep hitting that button, girls, <laughs> hitting that button. Uh, Lanny Lucy has donated five euros and has asked, do you know anywhere in Germany that helps foxes? I don't offhand. Google is a many, many wonderful thing or one of the other search engines. Um, there will be people in certainly all the European countries who help wildlife. Um, Google it, you'll find them or ring a local vet because they're likely to know a local wildlife centre. So there will be someone out there, promise you. Um, if there's anybody out there who really needs a wildlife rescue centre in Barbados, um, <laughs> please send me the funds. I will go out there personally and set that one up. Um, I love the Caribbean, though probably I don't want to be in the, the harmless just yet for those guys. 
that must have been a very rough ride. It's not only hurt the people, but it's hurt the domestic animals and obviously done a lot of damage to wildlife. So our thoughts are with you, particularly our prayers are with you um, to come over that quite quickly. Um, a couple of people have asked, how big are our facilities here? Is it just one building or do we have a couple of buildings? The actual loo that Laurie uses is quite small. It's about four foot square. Um, <laughs> it's like the TARDIS. Somebody came in the other day who's been talking to us for years and came around to look at the centre and said, I never realised it was so big. It is a bit like the TARDIS. You come in thinking, my God, is that all they've got? But it keeps going and going and going. So um, it has become a bit of a TARDIS. It's sizable, it's not as big as I'd like. The new centre which we're working with at the moment, um, which will be our legacy project to IDOT, um, is much bigger and will do much more work, a lot of educational work, which I think is so important because children need to understand that, sadly, my generation, because I'm an old, old what's it nowadays, I nearly saw then, but luckily stopped myself. Um, we haven't done enough to, to, to help this planet to any degree. Um, the kids are going to have to do an awful lot of work to bring it back to where it's got to be. So it's all time, it's all things to happen and we have projects ongoing all the time, short term projects, long term projects, all of which we're working on every single day of the year. Uh, we've actually had another donation from Lol Dongs who's written Super Chat has finally worked and has donated £20. You're so a star! Thank you, thank you very, very much! much uh, Taz has asked, do you actually live on site? I live here, I eat here sometimes. Laurie never eats. Laurie eats once a week. He really worries me. He's becoming a little skeleton. Anybody wants to send in food parcels, uh, <laughs> I think he'd appreciate it because he's a skinny little bugger. But it means he can get up trees quite easily. Um, yes, I live on site. Laurie lives on site. Abby escapes every time she can, but we don't let her escape that much. But she's quite close by, so we can give her a call. And obviously all our rescuers are scattered all over the southeast of Bill. We've got a lot of numbers we can bring if somebody's closer than us, they can go out and suss out a situation and we'll join them if we need to or they can bring it in to us. Um, it's all about networking, it's all about getting other people to do it. I can't do it all and as I get older I can do less and less and less. Um, but if we get the youngsters involved and get the youngsters keen and excited, because they need to be, we need the wildlife in place for their future, for their success. Um, so yeah, come and join us guys, come and join us in whichever way you can, be it giving money, being given time, being leaving a legacy, anything helps, every single thing. Never think what you can do, what you can do won't be enough because it will make a difference. Uh, so unfortunately it's the final couple of minutes now guys. Uh, I'm sorry if people are having difficulty actually seeing us or donating or asking a question that appears YouTube is having a couple of issues at the moment, so uh, apologies for that one. Um, Chris has just asked, what, do, what should people do if they suspect an animal is in distress in a public place? Watch it, monitor it, take a video, take a picture. Um, it will become apparent if it is in distress, you will know it. You will either feel it or you'll see it or something will happen to make you know that it's in distress and not just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Use your brain, basically. Um, not meant to be a rude comment. Look at it observe it for a bit and you will you will know whether it's in distress or they're just messing around. I actually got woken up the other night by the, about three o'clock in the morning by the most awful screaming in the garden and I thought an animal was certainly dying or something disastrous was going on and we had two fox cubs on our lawn, I flipped the floodlights on, they had two fox cubs on the lawn on their back legs both standing up with their front legs sort of attacking each other just play fighting really but the noise you heard was absolutely terrifying. I mean, I've never moved so fast in my life. I thought something was gonna die and we're gonna have to go out and rescue it. It was two young foxes play fighting. So watch, observe, and you will feel, you'll know when you, when and if uh, you need to interfere. Yes. Uh, just a couple of messages that I think you might uh, quite like to hear. So Daniel Renard uh, has put, no questions here, just love you guys and your work, keep it up, thank you. Love you this too. Very kind. Have you had any of our old friends on? Has Susan Blissett been on? Uh, or Joe no Cooper Susan. been on? We've or? had a couple of our volunteers, people like Lee, Lee Dunn, uh, is on as well. So thank you very much for your support and supporting us in the chat. Lucy? Uh, Lucy's there as well. Is Lucy still alive? I thought Lucy had died. Oh, I mean, it doesn't mean that. But she must really be dead, otherwise she'd be working here. I mean, Sean I can understand because he hates me. 
But Lucy, how could you leave me, Lucy? It's just unfair. It's unkind. I'm getting old. I can't cope. Um, Lucy, love you lots. Sean, you will always be the number one rescuer to me. You're even more patient than I am, so cool to you too. And anybody else who's come in from abroad, afar, away, wherever, love talking to you tonight. I hope you sign in next time. I hope you all continue to give money throughout the evening to make me a happy chappy. And one final comment to, to round off today, um, which is from State of Awakening, who just says, thank you for being an inspiration. People have called me many things, inspiration not so often. But yeah, I love what I do. Um, Laurie and Abby will tell you, as will many of the volunteers, I will whinge about it every single day of my life and I wouldn't change it for the world, and the day I retire will be the day they put me in the coffin, and I swear to God, I'll do the last rescue ever from my coffin. Love it, guys. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, so our next live stream is on October the 9th at the same time. Uh, please join us there. We'd love to see you, and please get your questions in. Uh, and once again, we'll try and get to as many as you can. Um, if you do have any suggestions for topics for these chats or anything that we could do just to change it up a bit please just leave them in the chat we'd love to hear your thoughts and we'd love to change change this up just to appeal more to you guys let's change the world guys it's all about you helping us helping you helping the planet thank you very much guys